That's not the answer. That's the oligarchs' answer because they see the world in a very specific way where they say that it's either socialist or capitalist. None of those should be options, let alone the only option. And with these guys, that's the problem. They want you to think that that's the only option, right? You have to be either you're a capitalist or you're a socialist. And no, you don't have to be either one of them. Both of them are evil, all right? I've been down this road before, but now I Welcome back to Big Pho Nation, people. I'm Big Pho, and if you've been here before, you know exactly what's about to happen. Somebody's about to get the kibosh. Put a little something like this. So, I've given that same treatment to Tom Sowell, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, Scott Adams. All because they very much like Georgia of Leontini are what we call flatterers. Now, if you want to hear about more about what that is, you'll have to go and watch some more of my videos because I explain all of it. And we're not going to explain it today. But today, we are going to deal with Mr. Peter Schiff. Why am I dealing with Peter Schiff, the economist, speculator, Puerto Rico resident? He runs a company called Euro Pacific Capital. He's a gold speculator. So why is he in my sights today? Because very much like the other people, Jordan Peterson, Thomas Sowell, Scott Adams, on the surface, they seem to be innocuous. They seem to be not necessarily saying anything that's super evil. <laughs> But if you take it on without thinking, then you end up following something evil. But if you dig down deep, then you end up finding that something evil. So I'm not here to say that he's a fool, right? There's many things that he talks about that I couldn't even necessarily challenge, you know? Like, for example, when he speaks about Bitcoin. I, I, I don't think uh, the cryptocurrencies are going to uh, work. I think they're fool's gold. I think that they're... They're speculative vehicles, but it misses the point. The most important point of any uh, money is its intrinsic value. But Bitcoin has no actual value. There's, there's, you can't do anything with a Bitcoin. There is no real world demand for Bitcoin. Yes, you can sell it to somebody else, but they'll only buy it if they think the price is going to go up. But somebody will only buy it from them if they think somebody will pay more. But the minute you run out of greater fools, uh, the, the pyramid implodes. For the most part, his objection to Bitcoins, I would share his objections. Uh, we might have a disagreement on why it's not valuable. Him is just strictly because... The most important point of any uh, money is its intrinsic value. It has no intrinsic value, which it doesn't. But there's also no government backing it up, right? It's not uh, applicable to taxes. So there's no promise to pay that make that has the ability to strengthen it. There's no productive society that it's based on. It's just based on people's willingness to buy lots of it. So we pretty much agree that Bitcoins are not necessarily a good place to put your money unless you're a speculator, unless you got a lot of money that you can put behind or unless you can get in really early. What he says about inflation, generally agree. How he describes inflation from bailouts of big banks. There's nothing really that I can say against that. One more thing that we agree on is going to be the basis of this video here. And that is that we have a date with, with destiny here. We are going to have a financial collapse. If we look at it, the economic system as it is today, he's speaking about America, but not just in America, worldwide. The economic system is in big, 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 big trouble. And if nothing is done, we could be heading towards some sort of a collapse, you know, a big collapse. Not just a collapse of the dollar, but collapse of like <laughs> all the agreements that different countries have with each other if all of this stuff collapses as bad as it could collapse. But although he's correct in saying that we are heading for trouble, he's really wrong, dead wrong, when it comes to explaining what should be done about it. Even though it means people lose jobs, investors lose money, uh, you know, loans go into default, companies that are not viable go bankrupt, resources are freed up to be reallocated more efficiently and more productively. That includes labor and, and, and capital and land. Let new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed, you know, consumption to come down and savings to go up and 
new owners come in and more importantly, they're going to be more responsible than the owners who failed. So his solution is the worst possible solution that you could ever recommend. So if you accept his ideology or his take on how an economic system works. You know, laissez-faire where the federal government does very little. So the federal government is very small, does very little, uh, relying on Adam Smith and the invisible hand and, and, and the wonders of, of the free market. His description of the economic history of the United States. We had no paper money at all in the United States until the Civil War, right? So we went until 1961, right? Without any paper money. So if paper money was constitutional, we would have had it before 1861. And his morality. Greed is fine when you're an entrepreneur. Then we will be in a situation where we'll be prevented from doing the right thing, right? We'll be prevented from doing what is necessary <laughs> or taking the necessary action to salvage the situation that we find ourselves in. So what I'll do here is briefly explain his stances in those three places what I just described this way that he sees the economic system, how he thinks of it as working, his history of the United States as he sees it, the economic history of the United States as he sees it, and what he thinks is moral behavior. So I'll go briefly into those and then contrast them <laughs> with the reality. Okay. So let's start with what an economic system is to him. First of all, it starts with a false paradigm. His whole conceptual idea, and many people have the same idea. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more caveat of why I'm doing this video for him, is that a lot of the things that he believes, a lot of other people believe. And there were things that I didn't necessarily describe in my Thomas Sowell videos that I can kill this bird with the same stone. So this false paradigm that he believes in with respect to the economic system and how it runs. There's only two ways to run an economic system, and that's either socialist, communist, or capitalist, fascist, right? Those are the only two ways that an economic system can run in his eyes. Do we need to be a nation of slaves or a nation of, of free individuals? I mean, that's going to be the real debate between big government and freedom. Is it going to be a return to free market capitalism? that leads to the promised land of uh, you know, a higher standard of living, or are we gonna complete the road to serfdom? Is America gonna be a totalitarian uh, nation with an all-powerful government? So you are either, you do anything, like the government has any responsibility whatsoever in the economy, that's automatically communist to him, or socialist, automatically. Any involvement whatsoever, that's communist. But on his side, which is interesting, his view of capitalism is very similar to what most people that make fun of communists and socialists, that whole idea of utopia, that's how he kind of views capitalism. We don't need a new form of capitalism. We need to go back to capitalism. The, the type of capitalism that we've been practicing has been the problem. But what we have now is an extreme and it's not because of capitalism. It's not a failure of capitalism, it's a failure to have capitalism. So anytime that somebody would criticize capitalism, he would always say, well, it's only because there's never been real capitalism. And if Jesus was running capitalism, then it would be running right. But until that day, we're always gonna be screwed because socialism always creeps in. Whenever the government uh, mixes socialism in with capitalism and creates a problem, it's always capitalism that gets the blame for the problems that socialism created. So this is his false dichotomy that he always sets up. When I hit with the reality, I'll explain what is the alternative to socialism and capitalism and why. So what does this end up making him believe? So one, he believes in the nominal value of a dollar. I guess he never heard of uh, Weimar Germany where everyone was trillionaires. <laughs> and broke, right? Wheelbarrows of money. His concept of profit is a nominal value. So it's an, it's, it's an amount of dollars, right? Which can be manipulated monetarily. And his concept of money, generally, the way that he sees money is something that should have an intrinsic value. So for him, money can only be gold for the value of the metal, 
the malleable, non-tarnishing metal that gold is. The most important point of any uh, money is its intrinsic value. The reason that gold worked as money is because of the inherent value of the metal, uh, its properties as a metal, uh, and the fact that it has so many uses. Uh, it's the most useful metal on the planet, uh, whether it's uh, for conducting electricity, uh, all the other applications it has that makes it such a good metal for jewelry or, you know, or other applications. You know, gold is valuable and gold can store that value indefinitely. Silver for similar reasons, but if he knew about what money has been historically, he would know that in England back in the day, they would use tally sticks, right? So that would just be two pieces of wood that go together. So you split them and the one half the government keeps and then the other half goes into the economy. That's a tally stick. In certain parts of West Africa, they were using cowrie shells. Um, all of these things were money. Salt, during the Mali Empire, salt was, was considered money. So money can be anything. I don't know what the intrinsic, intrinsic value is of a tally stick. You can't do anything with that tally stick other than return it for taxes, which is more closely related to what money is. Money is a declared value, but he doesn't believe in a declared value, which is why he rails against what he believes is fiat currency. Uh, we don't have sound money at all. Uh, we have fiat money, just you know, paper money they create out of thin air that has no value. Which does have its problems if it's not directed in, the, in a correct way, but just fiat currency per se is not just intrinsically evil. But he believes it is. And why does he believe this? Because he's a lover of Enlightenment philosophers and British ideologues of the, of the Enlightenment, such as John Locke and Adam Smith. To give you a little bit on John Locke, because uh, most of what Adam Smith believes relates directly to John Locke. So this is a guy that's a founding member of the Bank of England. If you go between like 1672 or so, all the way up to like 1701, he was like the Secretary of Trade and Foreign Plantations on the Board of Trade. Uh, for two kings, King Charles II and King William. And in those positions as the Secretary of, of Trade and Foreign Plantations and the Board of Trade, he passed the Woolen Act, Navigation Act, the revocation of, of all colonial charters. So th these things that he was the, the, the person that wrote, conceived of, came up with, these are the, these acts that he came up with were literally the grievances named in the American Revolution. So when Peter Schiff speaks about the founding fathers. Look, the founding fathers, the founding fathers, I mean, the founding fathers, uh, which is one of the reasons that the founding fathers by our founding fathers. He often refers to people like Adam Smith and John Locke, especially John Locke. And that's why he says things like that the, the most important thing is to protect your private property. We all have our inalienable rights of life, liberty, property, life, liberty, property, life, liberty, property, property, property. But even though John Locke did believe that, that it was the protection of property was like a fundamental right, America didn't believe that. Right? That's why they chose to say a pursuit of happiness, right? They could have said what he said, is that they, they wished to have a protection of property, but they didn't. They said they wanted to have a pursuit of happiness. America didn't go that way, even though that's the way that he imagines that America went, or he wants to believe that America went. Now, John Locke. What did John Locke believe about how an economic system works? He said literally this, "'Tis with a kingdom as with a family. Spending less than our commodities will pay for is the sure and only way for the nation to grow rich. So a kingdom is like a family. You have to spend less than your commodities will pay for. That's how you get rich. So if that's what you believe, then yes, all of his recommendations actually make sense. Let's eliminate all these government programs, make government smaller, cut government spending, and free up all those resources back into the private sector so that the free market can solve these problems. Now the private sector has more money to employ those workers productively. So there's, there's a lot of light at the end of a free market tunnel. Because for him, he thinks cutting is the best. We have to reduce our spending. He thinks that the more money that people have in their pockets, the more they're gonna spend that money on investments and then the, the economy will just grow. 
I guess he was not there when all the bailouts were given and then all those different GCVs or whatever they're called, too big to fail, globally systemically important banks, they just held their money. They didn't spread them that money around. A lot of people, when, when times are tough, they don't actually just go out and just spend the money if they have it, they save it. But he believes this. So you can understand that if someone believes that a kingdom is like a family, in that sense, how he sees a family, and if he believes this slogan that he heard from John Locke, because he, he wrote this in many different papers, it's like his uh, catchphrase, then you would agree that if spending is the thing, the, 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 bi the biggest spender in the, in, the, in the national economy is the government. That's who, does, that's who spends the money. That's where the money comes from, right? So if that money that is created is not directed towards productive businesses, if it's not directed towards wages or social programs or healthcare or education, and if there's no regulations, then what he's saying is that there would be all this money now freed up and available for what he calls private sector. And free up all those resources back into the private sector so that the free market can solve these problems. Now the private sector has more money to employ those workers productively. And then this private sector, who he thinks is so responsible, will be able to create the jobs. Which is interesting because, as we'll go over later, the American system of economics dictates that the money that's created should be going directly to private industries. So you must think, so if he doesn't want the government to be doing that, then who does he want the money to be going to? And then you remember yourself, oh, he's not, he doesn't run like a factory. He's like a gold trader. I have a bank here, Europe Pacific Bank. You know, we ship gold where we sell gold. Well, look, as a trader, you know, my company is ship gold. I, I think I got the best prices. If you don't believe me, just shop around. Uh, but I think, you know, people should be buying. And I've been telling people to buy gold for over 20 years. When I started recommending it as a broker. Right? He's a speculator. So his money is made in the financial industry, service industry. He's non-productive, right? But every time he says private sector, you just think private as in non-governmental. But there's a big difference between like a Wall Street banker and like a steel manufacturer. So it's funny that he's saying that the government should not be trusted to divvy out the money, but the private sector, which is the bankers like him, right? They are the ones that the money should be made available for. So cut the schools, cut the wages of the people, cut the social programs, cut the healthcare, cut, cut directed spending, right? Government, get out of the way. You just pay for the police to protect my stuff, his stuff, right? Because he, own, he, he owns the gold. You know, my company is Shift Gold. I, I think I got the best prices. If you don't believe me, just shop around. Right? <laughs> and make the money available for him and his cronies. Now, as far as the, the history of the United States, this whole worldview that he has comes in a little bit even closer into, or a little clearer into focus. Because he's saying, like John Locke says, a kingdom is like a family. Spending less than our commodities will pay for is the sure way to become rich. Now, that's the sure way to become rich if you're like a, like a oligarchy, an imperial oligarchy that's not really caring about production, that's really just rampaging all over the world and basically manipulating people into, into giving up their resources by um, persuasion, <laughs> violent persuasion mostly, interrogation and intimidation. So that is the way that the imperial mindset would be. And John Locke, Adam Smith, the people that Peter Schiff believes in, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in necessarily Alexander Hamilton or Benjamin Franklin. These are not the people that he mentions when he talks about the founding fathers, but he's always saying founding father this, founding father that, founding father this. Look, the founding fathers, the founding fathers, I mean, the founding fathers, uh, which is one of the reasons that the founding fathers by our founding fathers. But you notice when he, when he actually says names, it's always John Locke, Adam Smith, invisible hand, let the market decide, right? And these are people that didn't really believe like in morality, right? Let the God figure out how, how good things are. You do how you feel, f follow your pleasures and, you know, avoid the pain and, and don't worry about how things turn out. 
So when it comes to the, his the economic history of the United States, he says some really wild things here. He says things like paper money is not legal tender in the United States. Uh, which is one of the reasons that the founding fathers, when they established the United States, did not want paper money. And so they specifically banned it. If you understand how the Constitution is written, you'll see that paper money is illegal in the United States. They, they said gold and silver are legal tender. They said no state can make anything other than gold and silver legal tender. And the only power they gave to Congress was the power to coin money, which is gold and silver. We had no paper money at all in the United States until the Civil War, right? So we went until 1961, right, without any paper money. So if paper money was constitutional, we would have had it before 1861. Right, but it actually does say in the Constitution that the Congress has the right to coin money, to set rates on it, and to regulate it domestically and foreign, right? Now, where he gets this idea, <laughs> which is interesting, that they can only use gold and they could not use paper is because the wording in the Constitution says coining money. But where he gets into problems is because money doesn't mean it has to be gold. Money can be anything. <laughs> Right? So he believes that, and he, and he says that, that, my, that the first time that paper money had ever existed was with Abraham Lincoln. That Abraham Lincoln was the first person to, like his greenbacks that Abraham Lincoln produced. That was the first time that America ever used paper money. We had no paper money at all in the United States until the Civil War, right? So we went until 1961, right? Without any paper money. So if paper money was constitutional, we would have had it before 1861. Which is not true. And then the last thing, what he says, <laughs> based on his outlook that he has here, his strange worldview, he believes that greed is good. Greed is fine uh, when you're an entrepreneur. Right? When people like him are greedy. Capitalists enrich themselves by enriching others because the only way you can make money in a free market is through voluntary exchange. And people like him, who is he? a gold trader, a speculator, a banker, somebody who won't even stay in the country in order to avoid taxes. He lives in Puerto Rico. So he doesn't even, he, he, he will not even stay in the country. He, he hates paying taxes so much that he won't even stay in the country. You no, know, I live in Puerto Rico. When you move to Puerto Rico, you no longer have to pay the federal income tax. I don't have to pay the taxes. But he's saying that his greed is a good thing. But the greed in the government, there is the evil. The problem is, Greedy people also go into government. And what happens is those greedy people, those evil people go into government, and then they enrich themselves by impoverishing others. Capitalists enrich themselves by enriching others. The bureaucrats enrich themselves by impoverishing others. Now, nobody's saying that greed in the government is not evil, but greed is evil. So it's evil even when a banker or a money changer or a gold trader does it too where he gets the idea that greed is great when a speculator is greedy. Okay, when, and it's funny because he loves to play on both sides of the fence, you know? He likes to act like he's talk, he's pointing the finger at the bad guys while being one of them. So the people like him, the speculators, right? When the 2000 crisis happened, when they were packaging all those mortgages together, right? And selling them off as actual assets. What was that based on? That was 100% based on greed. Right? Speculator greed. Private sector, right? Greed. So how is that good for anybody? So that's that's kind of where he gets you with the with the lie. Now, let me go a little bit into how we know that what he's talking about is false. How does the economic system work? Right? We spoke about that for him, profit is like a dollar amount, right? You measure profit in dollars. But in the American system, you don't measure profit in dollars. You measure profit in surplus of output production, right? Production output. So if you want to understand it, you think of it this way. Think about if, if, you, if your nation was, was, a, was a company, right? It was all like one big agro-industrial firm, right? The whole system, including like the the transportation, all the production that's required, all of that is all in one system. And you think of it like a thermodynamic system, right? Like chemistry, like any of you guys taking chemistry, right? So you have an experiment, it takes a certain amount of heat to make the, the experiment happen. If you don't have enough heat, the change won't happen, 
right? The desired change won't happen. And, some, and there's always going to be some sort of a loss, right? You're going to get some heat that's going, to be, that's going to escape out of the system, right? But there's a certain amount required, a threshold. After you get to that threshold, then the process will happen. So you think of this, the system, an economic system, is like a thermodynamic system, a closed system in a similar way. So there's a certain amount of production that's required to, to actually make the system run. Now, you can figure this out. Anybody can figure this out, right? You do, you do a census of all the houses, right? The homes, right? In, in the census, you're looking at the age groups of the people, whether the people are under the working age, at the working age, or above the working age, and what are they working in? Are they working in production, productive uh, uh, things, or are they working in non-productive things? And non-productive doesn't necessarily mean bad. Although people like um, Peter Schiff are definitely, um, are definitely non-productive. They are speculators, right? Service industry is non-productive. There are some non-productive things that we need, like education, um, you know, healthcare, um, scientific research. These are all non-productive per se, right? So you're looking at how the households are divided, right? How many of the house, how many of the households, and how many in the households are involved in productive work, and how many are involved in non-productive work. And then you look at what's the, the, mass, the market basket of goods that it takes to keep the productive households going. What's the market basket that keeps the non-productive households going? And then you do a similar thing to the, the productive businesses, right? What does it take to keep the inventory producing at a consistent level? Like how do, how, what is, what productions, what products consumption is required to keep that business running and to keep these families running, right? So then what you, what you'll find out is that once you've produced enough to keep all the families running and to keep all the businesses running, anything that you make on top of that is your profit. So if you can make, if you can produce more than is required for all of these different places, for the businesses and for the households, then you have a profit. Now, this profit, you don't just get to keep all of that, right? You're still going to need to, uh, you know, subtract from that profit what's, what's basically going to be your cost, right? Because the, the, the non-productive houses are basically going to be a cost, right? So then you, so you can figure out from this, you can basically figure out what your net profit is going to be, right? And that net profit, if we go back to that thermodynamic system metaphor, then the net profit is any production that you've made above and beyond what it takes to maintain the system, right? So you can, if you have that net profit and you divide that net profit by the, the amount uh, required to, to keep the productive households going, and the amount required to keep the productive business going, then you're gonna have the rate of profit. And that number, that fraction, has to be increasing. And as long as that number is increasing, then you're A-okay, right? If that number starts decreasing, then you're going towards a collapse, right? So if you want to keep that number increasing, because left to its own devices, it will have to decrease, right? If, but the, the only way to keep it uh, continually growing is that some of the non-productive spending has to reap some rewards. So you have to be spending on things like, that's why you're spending on things like education and you want it to be quality education because you want to be developing minds that will produce new things, come up with new ideas, discover stuff, right? And the same thing with your scientific investment because as discoveries and things are made there, those discoveries will be added into your method of production, right? So as, as things like depreciating costs or depreciating, depreciation costs, right? So to avoid having your depreciation costs eating completely away at that net profit that you're creating, you need to be constantly increasing the technological um, innovation that's applied to your production, right? Because if the, if, if, the, if the technology stays stagnant, then very quickly, not instantly, but very quickly, your net profit starts getting eaten up, right? So if you, if you freeze your technology at, at, at a point and you're not still feeding new processes into that 
net profit that you have. You don't get a collapse immediately because you can keep transferring some of that net profit into reinvesting it back into um, the businesses and whatever into the society, right? You can keep investing some of it, but then eventually you're going to run that down. And so at first it, you're, you can still get a profit that's rising while you're still replacing old production methods with new ones, the ones that are still waiting on the shelves. When all the old ones go out of style and they're replaced by the new ones that you had already in stock, then you're going to start running into depletion costs because, you know, every production method is that somewhere down the line is coming from a primary industry, whether it's fishing, mining, um, you know, I can't think of farming, right? So as time goes on, all of those different things are going to become more difficult to do. If you say if you're mining, right? Yeah, at the beginning, you're going to have really high concentrations of whatever it is that you're mining. But as time goes on, you're going to have lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser concentrations of whatever it is that you have. Say it was, say it was uh, gold ore, right? At the beginning, the gold's everywhere. You can pick it up with your hands. As time goes on, the, it's, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and it requires more technological uh, applications in order to uh, retrieve the same amount of gold, right? So... Once your processing stops improving, then you start getting hit with the depletion cost, right? And that depletion cost will wear out all of the, all of the profits that you've made. Now, once you're on this collapsing trajectory, right? At this point is where actually where we are right now. And this is where our friend is saying that the answer is to, and our friend being Peter Schiff, that the answer is to make cuts. But what I would have done on the federal level is I would have dramatically cut government spending and free up all those resources. Resources are freed up to be reallocated more efficiently and more productively. That includes labor and, and, and capital and land. Back into the private sector so that they can be used efficiently again. But that new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed you know consumption to come down and savings to go up but that's unfortunately the worst possible thing that you can do because savings is not what was making this run and savings is what will actually kill it right because if you start cutting the wages if somebody is accepting a dollar an hour and that must mean that nobody offered them a dollar fifty nobody offered them two dollars i mean this is a competitive uh, market right. people people are going to accept a job that's the best one they can get and so if somebody is working for a dollar an hour or two dollars an hour by default i know that they couldn't find a higher job than that if you start cutting you know um the social programs the health care and all of these systems that, that remember we were saying at the beginning, that, that there's a certain amount that it requires to run households, to run businesses and all this. So if you start cutting that down, you're cutting down how much it takes to run a household. The household starts to fall apart. You're cutting down how much it takes, to, that how much you're contributing to the business. The business starts to fall apart. So this whole thing starts to crumble. Your, your, your basis for creating profit starts to crumble. And then once the... Once your basis for creating profit, which is, remember, the surplus, right, of production crumbles, then the only way to make a profit is an artificial profit. And that artificial profit is monetary, right? We are going to have a financial collapse when the Fed has to make that choice that I just described, either letting interest rates skyrocket and letting the economy implode in, in a way that we've never seen before, or how do we get through hyperinflation when we wipe out the value of our money. So you can artificially, um, you know, print a whole bunch of money in order to catch up with the obligations that would now be piling up, that you're no longer able to pay back based on, um, based on surplus production, right? So you can do that, or as uh, Peter Schiff would want, right, for savings. The debts are not gonna be repaid. The question is, is it better to inflate them away or default. I think default is better. Letting interest rates skyrocket and letting the economy implode in, in a way that we've never seen before. You can cut down the amount of, uh, of dollars in circulation to raise the value of the dollar artificially, but both of these are going to have their own set of problems and, and both are, are, are horrible. 
Um, Germany is the perfect example because <laughs> they did both. They went from printing, I'm talking about in the, in the 20s, right? In the late 20s, Germany. They went from printing a whole bunch of dollars to, to recalling all of the dollars, right? And both cases were, 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 were killing people. But, the, but bringing the dollars back was worse even than printing the dollars, right? It was better when everybody was trillionaires <laughs> than it was when nobody could, 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 could when, they, when they had to turn their trillions in for like one dollar or one, one bill. Um, so that's basically how it works. I wanted to be able to show you graphs and stuff like that, but I just had to explain it. So I had to make it a little bit simpler. I don't want to go into formulas and stuff like that, but generally that's how it works, right? So there has to be a factor of improvement added to your, to that surplus in order to maintain it. If you're not adding that factor, which comes from the technology, if that's not constantly being added, meaning like investing in education and in um, and then scientific research, that's not, if you're not feeding that in order that you're going to get that extra factor that will increase your, 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 your surplus while also decreasing the cost, right? Because it costs less to produce things when you are, are, um, applying a higher level of technology to that production, right? But he ignores all of this, right? So he just pretends that the collapsing economy is just how economies are. Recessions is the free market's way of fixing the mistakes that the government and the central banks create. And so you have to allow a recession to run its course. The government has no money. So the government is powerless. And then the only way that you can affect them is monetarily. So you either print more money or you cut, cut, cut down on money. And the way that he looks at it is he says, you know what, forget it. Instead of what we're saying, where we're going to, where you're going to spend all this money on all the, like the productive businesses, right? The amount that it takes them to run, you're going to make sure that they, that that, at least that amount is available, right? So that they can maintain themselves. The thermodynamic system, you don't want it to collapse, right? He says, no, let it collapse. Even though it means people lose jobs, investors lose money, uh, you know, loans go into default, companies that are not viable go bankrupt. Resources are freed up to be reallocated more efficiently and more productively. That includes labor and, and, and capital and land. Let new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed, you know, consumption to come down and savings to go up and new owners come in. And more importantly, they're going to be more responsible than the owners who failed. Right? Because from his point of view, once, once all these businesses, these productive businesses collapse, then they'll be worth very cheap. And people like him, the gold traders and speculators, can come in and buy it up. And from his opinion, they'll be more responsible. They'll run it more cheaply, run it more efficiently, run it more responsibly, right? Let new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed you know consumption to come down and savings to go up and new owners come in and more importantly they're going to be more responsible than the owners who failed so this is what he's advocating for when you're selling gold you don't care which way the the, the economy goes either way you're making money right and that's why he's promoting the 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 collapse in order to kind of to um, increase the insecurity, right? So the more people buy gold and he's selling it, but um, that's not what you do. So you can, so the, the economic system doesn't work if the government does nothing, right? What the government has to do is when you think of the thermodynamic system, when the government thinks of itself that way, the government has to, by Congress, right, um, uh, set aside the amount of dollars that it requires or produce, right? Coin, as the, as the constitution says, they need to coin and make available the amount of dollars that can sustain those production businesses and those families, right? To keep the system running. That's, that's what it's supposed to do. But it's supposed to make sure that that investment is in production and in development. Those two things are what are keeping the thing afloat, right? You want to add a factor of technology to the to the, the to the surplus, right? 
and you want to and subtract and and subtract that same thing from the cost right and you want to produce enough resources right you want to you want to have the production be effective enough that it keeps everybody going because that's 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 when people say that consumption is important this is what they're supposed to mean that there's a market basket involved in every Household, productive or non-productive, takes a certain amount to run a household. That means how much electricity does it take? How much food does it take? How much clothing does it take? Hydro, water, all that different stuff that it takes to run a household. If it's anything less than that, the house starts falling apart. You have to turn the lights out. You can't, you can't use the washer or dryer or whatever it is. This is none of this is good. And you can't like, we're not going to go back to if the people have to start like boiling their clothing and doing all this other wild stuff in order because they don't have enough, say, electricity, right? Then it's going to, it's going to slow down everything that they do, right? If you have to start washing your clothes with a washboard, <laughs> right? You're not going to be as productive as a person because that's going to take a lot more time to do, right? If you have to start cooking over a fire, <laughs> right? And like with logs and stuff like that, then, you know, it's going to be much more difficult to run a household than if you can run it with the electricity in the stove. So cutting is not as simple as he wants you to think it is. And that savings isn't a real savings because... It's, it's, because what he's trying to save is, a, again, a dollar amount. And the dollar amount is basically a meaningless thing, right? A dollar, a, dollar, a dollar is what you declare it to be, right? It's a fiat currency, which means I promise to pay. And this dollar is going to be worth whatever it's going to be worth in the next cycle because of all the stuff that we're going to produce. So we're going to produce all this stuff. You have one of those dollars. Look at the stuff you're going to be able to buy out of this surplus of production because we're going to produce more than it takes to run this whole thing. So if you, if you think that cutting wages or that minimum wage is the problem, you have to think that if you lower the wages of the people, then you're letting the houses collapse. And that's one of the things that it takes to actually run the system, <laughs> right? Once, once the pieces start falling off the machine, then it, then it doesn't run. So that's the minimum that it requires to run. You can't go lower than that. Um, but he seems to think that you can just keep shaving that off because, again, his idea is a monetary idea. So he's thinking of like the dollar value because he's holding gold. So that's why where he gets that concept. But in the American system, that's not how it works. Alexander Hamilton's system that he created was based on production profit. Now, going on to the history of the American system's economics and the paper money not being a thing until Lincoln, American money, American system started with paper money. Way before it was even called America, there was something called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the Massachusetts Bay Colony was run on something called colonial script. Now, colonial script was paper money. The, the British Empire had all the gold. So America was only able to make itself great and strong, starting with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, because that was the first one. All those, they were running exhibitions and expos of all kinds because they were able to keep their machine going based on these promises. And by the time the promise comes in, they've created the surplus that backs it up. So that, that was the fiat concept is, is in, endemic, or, or not endemic, it's, um, it's integral to, to the American system. So you, it started out with the, with the colonial script. Abraham Lincoln brought it back because Alexander Hamilton, who was the one who created this paper money system, um, was killed in a duel by a traitor by, named uh, Aaron Burr. And once Aaron Burr took over, you know, they, they tried to get him, arrest him and all that. He ran away, <laughs> he got away. But then things went a different way after Alexander Hamilton was dead. And if you look at Lincoln, he's someone that looked up to Alexander Hamilton. So that's what he was bringing back. One of the founding fathers, right? Alexander Hamilton is the person that wrote most of the Federalist Papers, right? He is the brains behind how America was running. The reason why America is different than France's revolution and a lot of revolutions, because most revolutions will have, you know, a powerful person, a strong, with a strong patriot that's willing to fight. You know what I mean? People like Jefferson, you know, that's, he's a mixed bag, but he was more one of those kind of guys, right? But he wasn't the brains, right? If it was left up to just people like Jefferson, America would never have survived. But they had 
people like George Washington with the, with the you know the the courage and all this other stuff that he had right and uh, bravery and whatever that he had. But then it was mainly that he had people like Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin that were the brains of the operation, right? So. Alexander Hamilton conceived of a new way of looking at the value of money. So it wasn't anymore about having silver or about having gold. It wasn't about the money itself having an intrinsic value because the money doesn't have an intrinsic value. It was about the value being in, in the, the productivity level of, your, of, the, of the people in your society. What kind of society can you create that makes the people have a certain high level of productivity. If you can make the level of the productivity of your citizens super high because they're really smart and they're educated and they're creative, then your value, your dollar is more valuable than somebody who's got a lot of gold and uh, no ideas, right? Like the uh, the Spanish, the Spanish when they came to. America and found a whole bunch of silver, they were like bankrupt sooner or later, right? Just because they had all that silver, but there was no system to kind of run it. So Alexander Hamilton, uh, the system that he created was a paper money system. And uh, Abraham Lincoln, after the death of Alexander Hamilton, after Andrew Jackson, the filibusterer that was destroyed basically the banking system of America. The people who opposed the central bank, like Andy Daxon, who got rid of the first central bank, right? It's because they understand the potential for abuse. Abraham Lincoln was bringing it back. And then he got killed as well. And then when Abraham Lincoln was killed, then they had something called the Species Resumption Act in like 1870 or something like that, like four or five years after, Ab um, five, maybe six years after Abraham Lincoln was dead. And what happened with this is they went and they recalled all of the all of the dollars that Abraham Lincoln had printed, and that caused the worst collapse in one of the worst collapses in American history. All the farmers, the industrialists, right? People like Carnegie and things like that were basically bought out by gold traders and speculators from Europe and Switzerland, uh, England and Switzerland, London and Switzerland, right? Let new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed you know, consumption to come down and savings to go up and new owners come in. And more importantly, they're gonna be more responsible than the owners who failed. So these guys that had all their gold, because now America didn't have any control, they, they were able to direct their own destiny when they were printing their own money, their own promise to pay, right? And making sure that their thermodynamic system was producing a, a surplus. When they had to recall all, that, all those dollars, then they lost that ability to do that because they don't have enough gold to, to even um, to run any of that stuff, right? So everything was basically bought up by foreign money. And that basically caused America to almost rip it to pieces because, you know, in bad times, people turn against each other, right? So you have populism developing and, um, you know, the farmers against the industrialists and the industrialists against the laborers, and the laborers against the industrialists, you know? So that's what ended up happening, the, the, the Species Resumption Act. So it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't getting back to the American system, the Species Resumption Act, because they just finished killing Lincoln and they went exactly back to, uh, to what, what Aaron Burr was running after they killed Alexander Hamilton. So that's, that's a big fib, trying to say that the paper money was not really in the system and that Abraham Lincoln was the first to do it. We had no paper money at all in the United States until the Civil War, right? So we went until 1961, right? without any paper money. So if paper money was constitutional, we would have had it before 1861. Because when, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt came back into office, you can see he referring back to Alexander Hamilton as well, when he created things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and stuff like that. And uh, Kennedy, who was also in the same vein, um, and he came back with his, with his printing, right? All of these great uh, presidents that were killed. McKinley was another one that was that brought this system back. They killed his ass, killed Lincoln, they killed Kennedy. They tried to kill uh, Roosevelt many times, but he just kept living. But then he ended up dying, right? From uh, disease and stress and all that other stuff. So 
they ended up, you know, he ended up dying, which, but they, but they didn't get to kill him. But yeah, that's, that's how the, the American system works in terms of its paper money is that the value is not in the dollar. The value is not in the gold. The value is not intrinsic, it's declared. You declare it, that's where the freedom comes from, right? That's how they were able to free themselves from the British Empire and build themselves up bigger than any other nation had ever been. Look how strong his government was. Look at the military uh, machine that he was able to create, right? Look at Roosevelt, look what he was able to create. Look at George Washington's um, America that was like a bunch of colonies, right? And look at how, how they were able to just destroy the, the British Empire, right? They were able to do that because of the system that they set up or else they would have fell apart because that was the one thing that Haiti didn't have right? They had no control over their, over their money. They were sucked into this same monetarist, gold-dependent um, system, right? They weren't able to print their own money. They didn't have an Alexander Hamilton, right? They had a George Washington, they had a, um, they had a Jefferson, but they didn't have an Alexander Hamilton, and they didn't have a Ben Franklin. So that's why they were not able to continually fight off the, um, the French. Um, but yeah, that, that was, it was Alexander Hamilton that freed them by, by inventing this paper money system. So what he's talking about there is just pure lies. And then when he talks about morality, Greed is fine uh, when you're an entrepreneur because the only way you can make money in a free market is through voluntary exchange. The problem is greedy people also go into government. And what happens is those greedy people, those evil people go into government and then they enrich themselves by impoverishing others. Capitalists enrich themselves by enriching others. The bureaucrats enrich themselves by impoverishing others. It's just evil, man. He's talking about how um, uh, greed is good, right? Greed is good when people like him are doing the greeting or being the greedy ones because like their greed helps everyone, you know? He provides a service that everybody, people are willing to pay for or they're forced to pay for because there's no other options, right? But he, he's, 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 he's the most parasitical part of the, of the service industry. There are some elements of the service industry that are more useful than others, right? But generally the service industry is like a tax on the productive industry, right? In that, if we go back to that thermodynamic system that we're talking about, the non-productive sector is a cost, right? But it's a cost that you're willing to pay because it is the one that's going to give the your general, your overall uh, surplus, it's gonna increase it by a factor, right? And as you have other costs that are coming back in, like, deple like depreciate, um, depreciation, Depletion costs that are coming that are coming in over time, right? That is how you're going to keep the the rate of productivity increasing, especially in a situation where the the printing of money brings a debt, and because you have speculators, this guy's also talking about no regulation, which is what's so crazy. And the more, as more as long as the government keeps regulating and micromanaging, in many cases, it's the regulations. We don't have the efficiencies because we have too much regulation. You need Guys, savings. You need lack of regulation. Is because if your if your if your production is collapsing, then you no longer have that surplus to retire the debt that that money that that created money is is, is accumulating, right? But then if you, have, if you have no regulation, then that accumulation can actually increase at a, relation, at a, at a rate that's not really relating to the, the debt that was created in order to, to facilitate the production. It can just be going at, at, a, at a much higher rate, 10 times, a million times higher, right? Because you can have two people making a deal, a business deal, and you have some other, some other person that's making a bet on that business deal. And because that's from a financial institution, it still has to get paid. And this is basically what, what the Glass-Steagall law was supposed to do. It was that if you're uh, a merchant bank, you can't be out there gambling because we have to protect the bank. So if you're gonna be a merchant bank that's gonna gamble, then you should gamble on your own dollar, not on a dollar that has to be paid back to you by the government. So this is what it's so, what, why what he's saying is so like, so evil. It's because basically what he's saying is that don't, don't regulate. So allow the, the, 
the financial aggregates to grow at a ridis- ridiculous rate, right? Let them grow as uh, whatever they do, and, and don't, it doesn't have to be, have any relationship to the actual economy. And then make cuts to the, um, to the, to the productive side of the economy, and so now you, you don't have the surplus to pay. So then all of these, these, these new debts these, that the speculators are creating has to get paid back with dollars. So when you're paying this back with dollars, he wants to continually cut the productive side. So cut the wages, cut education, cut all this stuff. That's why, he, that's why he, these people always saying cutting minimum wage is the best uh, is, 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 the, is the godsend. If we didn't have all these occupational laws, all these payroll taxes, minimum wage laws, all the labor unions, if somebody is working for a dollar an hour or two dollars an hour, by default, I know that they couldn't find a higher job than that. They need to be able to pay a person two pennies if they can, right? But the thing is though, cutting wages is not gonna make up for the growth of the, of the financial aggregates and the, and, the, and, the, and the burden on the dollar itself. So that's, a, that's kind of a misunderstanding of, where, of, of, of how much savings are possible by making cuts. Because it's like, you're cutting the engine. That's the, that's the only thing that's making product, production. He sees himself, the private sector people, the gold money changer people, he sees that as productive. He thinks that if he can have more money, then he's gonna spend money on, on production and all this other stuff. But he's not, because he doesn't. He doesn't. He has no intention of running it at a high enough level, right? Because he, he. That's what he's saying. He's saying lower the wages. He wants to b- bid down all the all the all the oligarchs, all the gold tra- traders can stand around and they'll they'll bid down. The, <laughs> he says bid up, but really they would be bidding down the uh, the price of uh, of wages. So. You can't, you can't do that. What, what you're going to end up in that, that's the easiest way to inflation. So inflation becomes basically inevitable at that point when production is getting destroyed in that kind of a way. And so you have two horrible things that are happening to the dollar at once. The production, that's actually the, the machine, the engine that can pay those created dollars back is getting destroyed. So how, so this is, so this is just, this is just inflating. And then the debt that is uh, that is owed on that money is not just growing based on the on the money itself, but it's it's growing based on people betting on it. So that's like a, a, like a recipe for like a explosion, you know, and a collapse. So we are that is where we are right now, though. So in a sense, he's right when he says this thing is going to blow up. But what he's recommending to stop it from blowing up is to let all the biz- let the engine basically die. Let the engine die and then let guys like him come in and buy up the engine and run it on some cheap ass fuel. And he thinks that that's going to raise it back up and, and deal with this, the financial aggregates that are growing way out of control, which is not how it works. And he's against the regulation. But if you, if you, if you're against, if you, if you are pro regulation, then some of that, some of that growing, those growing obligations in the financial side or the financial aggregates, some of that um, will no longer be tied to the economy, meaning like it will no longer be something that the dollar has to pay back. Because actually, once the rate of printing, once the rate of printing dollars starts going at a faster rate than the bubble, which is the financial bubble, which is possible actually, then printing money actually doesn't help get like it, you, it's it, it's like uh that there's a thing called a triple curve and it becomes a collapse function at that point if you can maintain the production at a certain level this doesn't happen and if you can keep or you know these this is in the disaster scenario or if you could keep the financial aggregate level low enough then you don't have that problem but as that as the aggregate level increases the dollar has to increase to to catch it and because there's all these other things that the dollar has to pay for, it just, um, the whole system blows up. So you can't, you can't just stop uh, printing money. That's not, that's, not, that's not an option. And you can't uh, take the savings out of the engine. You can't cut corners on the engine, right? He talks about, uh, you know, if you want to get in shape, you got to go on a diet and, and work out. When, when somebody is out of shape and overweight, the solution is not to eat more, you know, it's to go on a diet, it's to exercise. 
Now he's talking about a serious diet, like a caloric intake deficit, like starvation, like that's what happens to to to, to third world countries. That's what's been happening to them. This that this exact system is that they're not allowed to have that productive sector, that area that's allowing them to create that surplus that they can pay their dollars back with. They're not allowed to spend on that. They have to spend with dollars. So they have this financial aggregate, this debt that the World Bank is giving them that's growing, and they have to keep paying that back with dollars. And that's why they're, they're, um, the value of their dollar is going down and down and down. So they'll have some third world country, it'll be like 10,000, whatever their, their coins are worth, to one of our dollars, right? That's because there's no re- regulation on the financial aggregates, and people can just be betting on them, and people like him do bet on them. So there's no scenario where greed is good. And the, and the place where greed is the worst is in the speculators, gold speculators, whatever they be. That's the worst possible place where you can have a greedy person. Because, then, because especially when they have this kind of a view of what value is, when they see profit as being like a nominal dollar profit and they don't care about whether you're producing a surplus of goods and they're willing to parrot, uh, parasitize or cannibalize the, the engine that's building up a way to pay back the debt you've created when you created the dollar. So um, forget about them being greedy and accepting them being greedy, right? And you can hate the government all you want, but uh, it's not just eliminating the government that's going to be the answer. Because then what you end up having is like robber barons. It's like, it's like he doesn't know why governments were created in the first place. It was to get away from these lords and these barons that were basically doing what he wants to be done, right? Where they had monopolies, like where Jesus went into the, to the temple and was knocking the tables over. It's because these guys were monopolizing. Well, there was like uh, the, the prayers or, uh, you know, absolution or whatever it is when you're making yourself, uh, when you're pleading to God, right? They, they had a cornered the market. So that's what he was saying is like, that's bullshit. You can't do that. If, 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 you, if you don't have a government, then you, you're led by these guys, the robber barons that are going to like pay you a penny. So uh, no, that's not the way it is. And wages should be increasing, right? You don't want to be trying to lower the wages. That's the dumbest thing in the world. It's funny that it's like the only, pe- the only people he's, he's so worried that like if the wages go high, then the people won't be able to hire them. So I'm asking you, even if you're doing a, if you're opening a business right now, do you want to pay somebody friggin' $4 an hour? What business could you create that you want to pay somebody a, a cheap ass price like that? If you're not evil. I don't know if I'm going to show this on a screen. Maybe I'll explain it now just in case. So you have a surplus of goods, right? And then you divide that by the amount that it costs for keeping the households alive and also the amount that it keeps to take the businesses alive. And that fraction over time has to be increasing because that's your rate of production. So there are factors that can affect that fraction that we just set up there. So uh, to the numerator, you can either have something that's adding to the numerator which would be the factor of um, the factor of technology, right? Um, so either it's going to be something like that that's adding, or if there's no, if that if that factor is not being added, then you have to know that another factor is being subtracted, right? So if that if that if that positive technological advance is being added, that's that's a factor that's going to be added to the numerator and added to the denominator, right? But, I mean, add it to the numerator and subtract it from the denominator. But if you do not have that factor of technology being added to this function, then you're going to have a factor decreased from the numerator and added to the, to the, um, to the denominator, right? And over time, it gets worse where you're going to have two factors subtracted from the numerator and two factors added to the denominator, right? So if you kill technology, those are the functions that you end up um, having to deal with. And if you set an equality <laughs> and you have the, the first function, say, it's, say, say if you say that um, K equals the factor of growth based on, uh, 
based on technological advances and you say that um, or like k times s let's say if you say s prime is the profit okay i'm going to just speak it out and you can write it down i don't know if i'm going to show it to you or not but if you say that s prime is the the profit right the surplus profit then if you say that um uh c plus d is the product c is the is the is the um C plus V is C is the um, is the production is the cost of, of a productive house right I mean a productive um, C is the is the co- is the cost of a productive business and V is the cost of a productive household so S prime over C plus V right now if you do the so that so that's 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 the general form of what's happening but over time. There's going to be either factors, there's going to be factors added or subtracted from the, den- the numerator and the denominator, right? So if you're doing, if you're adding, if you're having, if you're receiving techno- technological rewards, then say that that's, uh, that's that S prime, that's S prime times K, right? Which is some factor uh, of, of, of the surplus will be increased, right? So it'll be increasing by some factor. And then at the same time, it would be decreasing from the cost, right? So that's the, that's the good one. So the, <laughs> the equality sign would be going in, the, in a good direction. So that the, you're starting out with something lower and you're getting out, you're ending up, you're starting with a, low, with a smaller fraction, you're getting a bigger fraction. But then if you go from the, uh, but if, but if your techn- technology is not increasing, then you're going to start out with uh, the S prime over C plus V on the one side of the inequality and then the on the other side you're going to have some because the um, you're going to have the s prime being s- subtracted by say um what would we call that say um s prime subtract so say 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 d s prime so some differential of s prime right so you're going to have so that so but that same differential is going to be added to the denominator so in this case, you're going to have a, a function. It's going to be getting. It's going to be getting smaller. The number is getting smaller, and that th- that rate of, of shrinking is only temporary because over time, another factor comes in, which is the depletion cost. So that's also going to be subtracted from the numerator and added to the denominator. So you'll be moving in the wrong direction. So for people that want to work it out on paper, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll put up a picture. We'll see. Maybe you're looking at a picture right now. If I did, if I did it, um, but that's about it. Um, I may have to do another, another, another full thing just on the, on just on this, uh, on this production itself, as opposed to in in the context of arguing with Peter Schiff. But I can tell you that his what he's saying about cutting uh, in order to get savings. Let new owners step up and buy in bankruptcy a lot of these companies that were so mismanaged and allowed you know consumption to come down and savings to go up and new owners come in and more importantly they're going to be more responsible than the owners who failed is not going to work right even though his friend john locke says that it is with a kingdom as 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 with a family spending less than our commodities will pay for is the sure way to be good for the nation to grow rich that's not true you don't, you don't, you, you can't, you can't get there just by savings. That is true. If you are the guys sitting on all the gold and you're not doing anything, then yes, you're, you're the only way that you're going to make money is that by saving. But if you have some, a system like the American system of economics, where the value is, is based on like a production surplus, then you have to keep that, as we said, thermodynamic system running. And not only that, you have to be able to, you have to put enough energy to take into account things like the waste, right? In in a in a thermodynamic experiment, it'd be like friction, heat loss, it'd be things like that. But in the real economy, it would be things like non-productive households, right? And jobs. So, but those jobs, some of the non-productive jobs are really important. They're crucial. So we don't mind paying for healthcare because we need to keep people alive. That's one of the most important things, right? <laughs> what good is a scientist if he's dead? So you have to keep people alive and you have to to keep developing the new people that are going to be replacing the old people, right? That's why you did the census at the beginning to see those those brackets of age groups of who's there, right? So you can see 
what's required. Those, those young people, you're going to need to be spending that amount on the schools so that they can come in with a better idea than their parents had and the better methods, right? And the better methods are not, you want to cut the cost, but you don't want to cut the cost by, by despite the, you know, by chopping someone's head off, right? We have, we only got three hats, so we need to chop off some heads, you know? That, that's, that's not how you do it. You make it so that people are more mentally capable. And if they're more mentally capable, then they're going to be able to think of better solutions for problems. And that's what you have to constantly be getting better and better and better and better solutions of problems. And cutting wages, taking your business to some other country like Peter Schiff does where he goes to Puerto Rico because he doesn't want to pay taxes here. Like that's, that's not the answer. That's the oligarchs answer because they see the world in a very specific way where they say that it's either socialist or capitalist, right? And Alexander Hamilton wrote his, his, you know, paper on manufacturing. As far as I know, he wrote that before, um, uh, Das Kapital <laughs> by, uh, um, Karl Marx. So, both the uh, Adam Smith and um, or John Locke and Karl Marx, they're both taking their stealing ideas from Alexander Hamilton. Okay, so don't let don't let either one of them take credit for his ideas, or don't let the good parts of of his ideas be associated with either one of these bad ideas. Right? Whether you're talking about socialist, capitalist, communist, fascist. None of those should be options, let alone the only option. And with these guys, that's the problem. They want you to think that that's the only option, right? You have to be either you're a capitalist or you're a socialist. And no, you don't have to be either one of them. Both of them are evil, all right? So that's all I got to say. See you next time. I'm Big Foe. I've been down this road before, but now I got my shit together.